Hello! Hi there. Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where we know up big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based at NYC dedicated to the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and I have a PhD in microbiology. I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I also worked as a research integrity specialist, and I'm currently working as an editor for a scientific journal. Every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today it's our news week where we do an overview of the papers that we've seen in the news or other sources to try to find an article that we want to cover next week in more detail. Next week will be our deep dive week where we take one of the articles we choose today and look at it figure by figure to learn what it can and cannot tell us. So make sure to subscribe to satisfy your microbiology curiosities. You can follow along with the papers we discuss on either week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use comments to tweet, uh, tweet us or you using the hashtag microTWJC hashtag. And uh, boy, do we have a show for you today. We have some more news mm -hmm. about whether SARS-CoV-2 lives in the gut. And we can also, we'll also be seeing whether you can mix and match vaccines. But that's not all. We also have a paper where scientists fill in, uh, film the, the production of malaria gametes. And we also see hidden E. coli in the bladder or bladder-like cells. We all get into it when we get to it. Um, not to mention <laughs> incredible new bioengineering discoveries are like a revolutionary new way to rewrite, rewrite DNA. And we find out how we can uh, do over a thousand experiments on an area about the size of this calculator. Uh, but first, we have a mystery. What is happening with the birds of America? Yeah, I found this, uh, I thought it was just like a strange news article. I think in The Atlantic it was posted. And then I was like, oh, let's follow it down to the single report. And uh, apparently people have been noticing in the D.C. area in the States, uh, songbirds have been dying. And they have some strange crusty um, stuff around their eyes. And uh, so it's thought to be something infectious, and the public health recommendation is to clean your birdhouses um, if you're, like, trying to attract songbirds, I guess, into your garden. You don't want to, uh, I guess, promote the outbreak, whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, they published this uh, on the last second of what they've done. It sounds like they've looked for using transmission electron microscopy, using, like, eye swabs of corpses they looked for like cause of it might be and they still don't really know what it is um yeah kind of a strange thing but they do reassure people that this is something that happens at some frequency in some other populations um and yeah just report i guess and they're still trying to figure out what's going on <laughs> Yeah, this is really an interesting story, because it is a mystery. We we don't even know whether it's a microbe that's responsible or not. I mean, <laughs> there, there's a number of theories that I've read about on that have been going around. None of them which have been verified, but there's one idea that it's connected to the cicadas coming back. So to brood X, the 17-year cyclical kind of insect that comes uh, out and attacks yeah. America. Uh, again, in the UK, <laughs> no idea well, what... Well, actually, they, they create... <laughs> they create... They're like... Uh, they're really tasty thing right like i think all insects it's usually considered like they've been collecting nutrients under the ground for so long and now all of those nutrients are like back up above the surface so that makes sense yeah it could be like something on the bugs yeah and the birds eat them so yeah so it would some be been, something been, that's been, new for this year yeah some theories say that it's to do with like pesticides perhaps like the these bugs have been in the soil, so they've been marinating in pesticides, and then these birds eat them, and they're all concentrated, and the birds suddenly get a hit, and that sure. could be it, but even then... Because it, it could make them more susceptible to disease, right? Because I think that, yeah. like, it sounds like they're all bound together by some symptoms, right, in terms of, like, oh, lots of certain types of death, and, like, they ruled out, like, the, I guess, the common pathogens that usually cause these types of outbreaks in birds, so, yeah, it could be something like they're getting more susceptible by something in the environment. <laughs> yeah, and also they've ruled out that theory I just told you, because if that oh. was true, then, <laughs> then it would have correlated to all the areas where this brood emerged. But apparently it's these bir there are birds outside of those areas and in, not in migratory distance. So, again, yeah. more layers of mystery. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> I mean, lots of people were theorizing, oh, maybe it's to do a fungal infection to the cicadas, but then, yeah, it's it's a mystery. We, we people are still investigating this, and yeah, 
I actually, one of the reasons I also chose it was, I mean, like, like we're, there's this mo morbidity, morbidity and mortality weekly report that the CDC puts out, and that's for, like, emerging human diseases, but I didn't really realize that there's also the same types of things that happen for animal disease. Um, I guess they don't have a journal, so it's not high tell because, I guess, you know, it doesn't seem like people are uh, super... There's not a lot of resources, I guess, to be super concerned about conditions. But there is something, right? There are some agencies that are watching these things. Um, yeah, it was just interesting to me that it hit the news in this one. Yeah, I mean, definitely, especially with bird deaths. I mean, one of the big concerns of the, has been avian flu. And so whenever there are bird right. deaths, people are often quite... That's why, like, the GSA, uh, G, GISAID... The, the resource they've been using to track coronavirus and their genomes was originally created for the avian flu virus yeah. uh, to track <laughs> that down. So uh, everyone's been waiting for an avian flu virus to appear. And the biggest fear when we see this kind of bird mortality is like, oh no, we're getting a two for one disease outbreak. This is going to be really... Right. Because there's almost been this like anticipation that the avian flu will come and it'll be much worse than other flu viruses. And now, but I believe that they did report here that they ruled out if it was the avian flu in yeah. this particular case. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. These are, this is more like a neurological symptom for the birds. So it's mm -hmm. a very mysterious thing. We'll be we'll keeping an eye out for for this story, and we'll let you know, even though it turns out to be a chemical or, or pesticide that's causing it rather than a microbe, because. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because yeah, this is an one yeah an absolute head scratcher. Um, yeah. Oh, and I think, well, I just want to connect it to one more topic, but like this is also part of, in some ways it is part of um, um, monitoring, right? Like viral surveillance and stuff, right? Like these types of events, like you want to do all the follow-up to make sure, like, is it something that could be a zoonosis? Um, and so like, mm, it also shows sometimes the health of a monitoring uh, in, uh, initiative if like these reports are coming out, right? Like you would hope that in places that do have like high rates of emerging viruses, this type of infrastructure is built out. Um, I think we sort of spoke about that briefly, like at the beginning of the pandemic, there was like a lot of, I don't know if people remember, like this idea of like, it's important to do bat surveillance because like these are places where viruses can like transmit. And so like you want to see these types of reports coming out because the absence of them really is like, we're we're not really looking hard enough for like potential sources of, of danger yeah and uh mm -hmm. speaking of uh so i've got an, an, another news story that i don't want to bring up because something this is something we've been following for a while so yeah. uh SARS so this is a conference abstract rather than a paper uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. uh, that is going to be either present presented sometime between june 3rd and november 3rd i don't know that's a oh, a long time. <laughs> a long window, yeah. That is a, a long window. But anyway, this is from the Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections. And this comes from uh, a story that we've been covering for a while about the the this potential theory that SARS-CoV-2 establishes like a long-term like kind of reservoir in the intestine after the cause of an infection. So mm -hmm. th we covered this in a paper called Evolution of Antibody Immunity uh, Against SARS-CoV-2, where... They, some researchers spotted that these antibodies that were developing at SARS-CoV-2 in patients, they kept devel developing and evolving even after the infection had completed, which kind of indicated that they're evolving to cope with SARS-CoV-2 that should have been gone, but it was still there. So they're wondering, okay, where mm -hmm. was it still there? And so... Uh, and Then they stained some biopsies and they saw that it could be in the gut. Yeah, they, they did some transmission TEM, I think, as well. But it was only in like they didn't have many samples. No, they <laughs> it was didn't. under five for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so the 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 same lab has got, gone back and they've been screening more patients. Uh, so in this case, mm. they looked then they're looking at things longitudinally. So this is like at, at same patients at different time points now, and seeing yeah. that they they still have the. Like so, they they stained the so what we've seen before is they've stained like gut biopsies and found that there's something that looks like N protein there and it yeah and also if you kind of zoom in and do an electron microscopy you find things that look like SARS-CoV-2 variants but you can't test that for certain because of the way electron microscopy works and the fact that gut is not a sterile site gut has lots of viruses and bacteria yeah. already so it's not been proven quite yet well not for for certain yet so they've been very tentative about the way they talk about it but 
yeah. this one lab has been persisting in trying to to look at it, and they've been doing bi- bi- biopsies uh, in regular biopsies in patients. Uh, so they, they test people at three months and four months, and then six months and seven months, and they still find mm-hmm. like viral antigen present in there. They do some e- uh, immunofluorescence and EM microscopy to get basically the yeah, same kind I of. I think kind if you scroll down, there's an image in this abstract. There is that indeed. Sort of yeah. Some of those things. So. <laughs> Yeah, here's some, some picture of what could be SARS-CoV-2 in the gut. Um, yeah, and this was sort of the stuff that we were seeing from the last paper. It's just that now they've taken more pictures. Yeah. <laughs> they've, they've found it in more individuals. Yeah, they've taken... I mean, it's it's quite... It's interesting, but it's not kind of the the kind of full uh, kind of... What was it? Um, smoking gun kind of data we'd want. Uh, cause some, so mm-hmm. I think I'd be looking for... So this is a story I'm... So this is the latest part of a long story that people are investigating at the moment. But what I'd be looking for is, uh, say, genetic genetic code, or like kind of are these variants evolving inside the gut, and then what could that mean for mm-hmm. for subsequent infections? And also, like one of the things that people have been trying trying in the UK at least is testing uh, sewage for the presence of SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So the question would be like whether this kind of long-term persistence will cause false positives and like later things like that kind of community testing. Yeah, like I feel like um, that that was, I remember hearing a lot of news about that as like a early warning. It was actually, I think it was shown that it was possible to detect uh, outbreaks from the sewage. People were just going hmm. back, right? Like they had sewage samples and then they would like, oh, look, we do see a spike in like the SARS-CoV-2 levels in the sewage, right? Like that correlates with this earlier or this later spike right of of cases that were seen in in the in the city um and so like i remember seeing those things so like pe- people do know that it passes through the gut but like this this claim that they're trying to make is that it somehow also like stays in the gut right and then like by staying in the gut it is some sort of it like elicits an ongoing um immune response of some yeah. sort so i guess what we'd want to see is we'd want to see like the the longitudinal poop samples from these people show like if we could take whole genomes from those samples and see that they changed over time i i guess that's part of that would be part of the evidence that would be yeah. helpful in in really solidifying the story yeah i'd feel mm-hmm. like the the evidence that these are like definitely your task you to two they're definitely replicating in the gut and also investigating the inflammation because i think the thing they find in this paper is there's not much inflammation in the gut which is so it's so it's there but it's not causing a disease it's just sitting there and making mm-hmm. the host slightly more immune to to SARS-CoV-2. So, I mean, I'd also, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's it's a weird kind of story. And I mean, it's mega complicated, right? Because yeah. there are lots of things that like sit in the gut that don't cause yeah. that much inflammation, right? The gut is one of those places that it sees so much foreign stuff that it has a lot of mechanisms to try to suppress the overreaction to things and often disease is in that intersection right of overreaction and like also some rampant replication of some sort <laughs> yeah so i mean it's an interesting story there's I, i'm not 100 percent certain whether we can fully say that it's a true thing or not i mean it, we, this is just one lab and they're only pre- they're not presenting all the kind of data we'd want to see from it but it's still interesting and i still think it's worth like keeping an eye on it just in case um mm-hmm and that brings us to the next paper, which is Immunogenicity and Reactogenicity of Heterologous Chadox NCOV-19 slash mRNA vaccination. Uh, oh, yeah. This is for people that have gotten a mixed vaccine, right? That's what it's saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've got uh, 97 study mm-hmm. participants put, received, like, uh, heterologous vaccination. So they either got the Chadox, Chadox 1 first and then the mRNA booster. And then they had like mm-hmm. f- control groups, which just had the Chadox one vector, and one that just had uh, the mRNA based vaccines. So mm-hmm. th- this is interesting from like and... two two main perspectives. Firstly, the the idea that okay, you can swap vaccines, and it's not only safe, but it's also still effective. Or could it be potentially more mm-hmm. effective? And the other one is that uh, this is, I think, one of the few studies where you actually get to see the two two types of vaccines compared head to head. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, were they in, were, I'm not sure if they were enrolled because it's a pretty small, 97 is pretty small sample yeah. size for a head to head 
right? Yeah. So it's like it's like uh, it's a scrap. We get to see like a little scrap of a head to head. Yeah, it <laughs> is. It is. This is a, a very small study, um, but uh, <laughs> but actually it clusters really well, like vector vector. Like there's not too much like variance in it. Like you can see some clear differences. <laughs> yeah. So I mean the clear. Uh -huh. I mean it seems like the the. The heterologous ones, where you get two both vaccines, that seems to be just as good as getting the mRNA vaccine. The vector vaccines, like the one that I got, are not don't seem to produce as much antibodies. Uh, as, but um, one other kind of wrinkle is that they have here is that um, that group was slightly older because because younger patients are, mm. tend to be prescribed the Pfizer vaccine, whereas older patients tend to be get get the vector vaccine. So that is a mm -hmm. potential confounder that could make this seem le like it's performing less well than it actually is um yeah because in b the spread of the vector vector group is actually huge yeah. compared to the other that ones that is uh it's just very strange actually that's like something that you might actually expect from an older population right because at some level there's there's some percentage of older people that may not respond as strongly or take longer to respond so um, and that could be what we're seeing in the spread. Yeah, there. although it, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm gonna like, but it gets a bit more complicated because the older group was, had a median age of 48. Well, sorry, I think uh, no, an um, average age of 48. The group that got like okay. both vaccines were 40, and the group that just got the mRNA were 44. So the actual age oh, difference okay. isn't that much. So these researchers actually went it. So I feel like I've I've slow played you in, in this a little yeah. bit, but I've. Uh, in the median, in the median, uh, though. Yeah, it's yeah, in okay. the median, actually. So, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But, so, they actually t decided to test in age-matched groups. So, uh, in the age-matched, so, oh. just to get to get out. They opened And up. even the age-matched groups, nice. the the vector vector doesn't seem to be doing, like, uh, as well. As, and these kind of, so these are, I should point out, these are indirect tests of immunity. So none of these correlate to mortality. This is mm -hmm. very much a, a phase two kind of thing where they look at uh, the antibodies and the T cells and the and how much are, are produced. So again, mm -hmm. it's not quite the, it's not quite the same as saying anything. So I want to point out, it's still... Wait, which, which figures are the age the matched? The age matched are, oh yeah, so they hid them in a supplementary figure. Supplementary figure... So, uh, extended data figure seven. I see. <laughs> because yeah, this is going to be a uh, quite a controversial thing. I think um, it's not uh, because I think we need to reiterate that the vaccines do work, and this kind this is a very yeah. small study that is prone to big variations that might not necessarily represent the whole population. So we need to kind of I need to, I feel well. I mean, also it it doesn't matter if you don't have right like. Uh, it might not matter if you don't have antibodies, <laughs> right? It, like it could be that those antibodies went down. Like right, we think that our antibody tires are also going to go down over time, whether or not that means that we have to get a booster or if that's just like, that's the natural course of things and your your memory cells are still ready to reactivate, right? Uh, to produce a protective response. Yeah, so, uh, I've, so I, I think that this is still like not quite fully baked, but uh i mean mm -hmm. uh yeah so yeah i was kind of i think that it's still kind of an important thing to maybe take i mean i mean it's it's weird because again this isn't entirely randomized uh, as well because of the way that the because yeah. the chadox the kind of chadox astrazeneca vaccine is given to a different age group and cohort than the mrna vaccination so mm -hmm. there is so even yeah these are not this is not a randomized yeah. control study this is like after the fact yeah <laughs> we're just like looking at like yeah the we're trying to see the differences in these two groups but these two groups have other factors that separate yeah them. so this <clears throat> so i feel like this d deserves a big kind of pinch of salt because i because the worst thing i feel that this could lead to is people saying oh i don't want a vaccine i want to wait to get the better one in which case and in the meantime they get the coronavirus and that will mm. suck a lot because then everybody loses in the end because having a, a vaccine is better than having no vaccine. It's way better than having no vaccine. So, right. Yeah. The other thing that I mean, the other thing is like I think the reason why this study is being published is not really to show like not, it's not about no. the head to head though, right? Like it's actually about whether or not it's fine to do the the swap. Yeah. <laughs> the the first dose with one and the second dose with the other. And so yeah, you're really 
that's not right. Like when these when these investigators design their study, yes, you might be able to see some differences in the head to head, right? But they were designing the study with the thought that they just wanted to see if there were any differences with the swapped version. Yeah. And it actually mm-hmm. looks like there's not very much difference in the swap version, uh, which is a good thing for mm-hmm. for not just for people who, who want to mix and match, but also like if we're thinking about boosters as well, because there are now people thinking about mm-hmm. adding boosters to the original vaccines. And the question is, should we, mm-hmm. do we need to boost for the same vaccine candidate or can we swap over to a different one? I think this uh, shows that maybe if we yeah. do boosters, you shouldn't be fussy about which vaccine you get because it just looks like safety right. wise they're about right. the same i don't know i mean i also i uh, i'm not sure what it is in the uk but i know uh in my home country in canada like a lot of people got swapped doses like uh, <laughs> like uh it because um because there was a push to give everyone their mm-hmm. first dose and that included the AstraZeneca vaccine. So then when the AstraZeneca vaccine was no longer being made, <laughs> then it meant that some people were still like waiting, right? And they just got a second dose of Pfizer or Moderna. Yeah. So overall... So this was also incorporated in the vaccine strategy of some countries. <laughs> yeah. So I think that, that... And that's a good sign, though, the fact that we can... That there isn't any kind of big side effects. And also the thing we'd want to make sure of is that there isn't a drop in the immune response or anything like crazy like that so i think that's a good thing and now we're on to yeah i mean yeah from these from these uh indirect (laughs) correlates of immunity but that's what we have right and it seems like it's borne out um with like the actual correlation to to uh having less uh severe disease yeah and (laughs) i mean this the study's still ongoing at some point they will end up posting about uh, pr- the protective efficacy efficacy data of these vaccines um and that'd right. be quite yeah because they're following these people even if it's a small cohort maybe they'll have more people yeah they'll, they'll enroll and on. yeah so mm-hmm. it's so it'll be interesting because i think that i'm uh i think the booster thing is an interesting story and i think that uh, it, the differences in how the vaccines operate might be an interesting thing as well um yeah yeah uh, but now we're going off to okay. a, a different story. We're looking at uh, a transmission event of SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant reveals multiple vaccine breakthrough infections. Yeah, so this is like one of these case studies where they look at a specific event where they have testing data. Again, it's not perfect. They don't have perfect testing data over the whole cohort, but they have like quite a bit. Uh, I think mostly from after the event, <laughs> everyone was traced back. I think that's how this this particular information was discovered. It was like they traced it back <laughs> to this one particular event, and uh, from it they can they see that I think uh, not everyone was like they're not sure if everyone was all 14 days after the second dose uh, at this particular event, but certainly everybody. Uh, was vaccinated to some degree. Um, and they find that people had uh, contracted some of this Delta variant. Um, yeah. From this. Uh, the, yeah. So, <laughs> like, case studies are always kind of interesting. It can give you a lot more of the story behind the, the science. And I think we generally treat them yeah. as anecdotes, but they can't, but they are often, like, cataloged in a way that we can eventually pull data from them or tell a story that can be useful for people in the future. And so mm-hmm. this is an interesting story. I think we saw some, we've seen some case, I, we covered some case yeah. studies previously, like people have done case studies of like what happened in this school or what happened in this airplane, right? And they kind of inform the way that uh, people react, right? Or people interpret some of the bigger statistical data being like, if these events can happen, then maybe we should limit them, something like yeah. that. In this case, it was a wedding with uh, 92 attendees, um, mm-hmm. and it's it took it took they took quite a lot of like the they uh, they, they did all the right things. They they required all guests guests to be fully vaccinated, and it took place outdoors in mm-hmm. a large open air te- te- uh, tent. Um, and uh, two mm-hmm. two of these people who were attending it came from India, and they got they were vaccinated with the mm-hmm. COVAX in about 10 days. So they, they arrived in Houston about 10 days after their second doses of Covaxin, um, so mm-hmm. in theory it should be okay, but we kind of know that after the sec- that it takes about two weeks for things to really settle up in between your 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 second dose, so maybe about two weeks. Yeah, and it, and it could take longer, right? Depending on age, everyone's yeah. different, so like that's another. Factor. And these <laughs> these people were in the age range of fifty three to sixty nine years old, um, 
And mm-hmm. so they traveled like via via airplane, and they were the first to actually become sick. So they one patient's complained of fatigue, but associated with the diabetes and jet lag. Uh, the second one developed a cough two days <laughs> after the wedding, and then eventually, like both of them developed a fever three days after the wedding. And while they were there, there were other people. So I think there were people who inv- who had gotten the Moderna vaccine. Uh, they they got mildly mm-hmm. ill. Uh, but the, those two got really, really badly ill, and I think one of them died. Uh, so mm. it's I- in- interesting, uh, and they're all with the Delta variant. So I think that so they yes. come from India. Yeah, I think the reason the reason why people would have shared like the reason why this is like a significant or share worthy sort of case study is uh, to highlight that idea that like vaccines aren't one hundred percent. They do a lot for us, right? Especially in terms of removing the the severe disease but like you might still get these transmission events and so they're trying to encourage i guess uh, different behavior sometimes yeah <laughs> so in total six uh six of these uh p- attendees at the wedding turned out with a cr- coronavirus case uh it's thought that the two mm-hmm. of them picked it up in india and then spread it to, and i think i should re- reiterate the delta variant is very transmissible uh so the r number has been mm-hmm. estimated between six and eight so uh if this wedding were like unvaccinated, would have expected uh, quite a few more people to Ooh. show up with symptoms. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and so, but I think this this does reiterate that vaccines are only one layer of protection, and things can still yeah. happen. But <clears throat> even th- though th- it was kind of tragic, but people who were vaccinated didn't all get very severe diseases. So it's uh, it yeah. <laughs> oh, Minimals commented uh, on uh, on the previous paper. Still, samples aren't sensitive for uh, uh, intestinal epithelium. Uh, oh, like you wouldn't see this shit. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. So it would have to be subsequent biopsy samples. So I mean, it also I also wonder though how deep like that statement like, but if you sequence really deeply. <laughs> Because you can find like very small numbers of things sometimes. I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm not like totally yeah. up to date on I that. I mean, I'm kind of nice, to, and I am always c- c- concerned about like maybe we pick up hybrid genomes where you pick up bits of fragments that somehow come and then create things up. Because there's a lot of like uh, art to to doing genome studies that right. is because w- when we read papers, we're kind of used to things being like tidy and put put together quite nicely, but. Actually, when you're in real research, things can be a lot more messy. There's a lot more kind of filtering that gets through well, before papers yeah. reach us. There's sort of there's some decision points, right? Like uh, when you're s- sequencing stool, like you could be like, should I, should I, um, should I sequence deeper, right, and not do any amplification? Should I do an amplification step and not sequence as deeply, right? Like these are sort of like some trade-offs, and they have their own sensitivity sort of like caveats as they're being used. So, yeah, I could see why that stool would not be sensitive to things that are in the intestinal epithelium, because, like, how much does the epithelium actually shed per stool passage, right? And those those viruses might get in. But I also think that there might yeah. be some knobs you can turn to try to turn up certain sensitivity, but maybe also increase false positive rates. Yeah. And what you were saying, like, finding some weird hybrid genomes <laughs> by yeah. stitching uh, together <laughs> there's... unrelated objects. Yeah, I mean, we we don't really know what SARS is doing in in the gut epithelium. That's why the people are studying it, and we don't know whether it actually like would end up like bursting cells or like ly- ly- uh, lysing into like the lumen of the epithelium. So yeah, um, but yeah, that's yeah a good point. um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, this is a good point. Thank you very much for commenting. Uh, it's always great when people comment. Uh. Uh, yeah, uh, so I think we've talked a, a bit about the, the, the Delta variant. I think next bit is we're still looking at uh, more variants. So the next paper we're looking at is cross-neutralization of emerging SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern by antibodies targeting distinct epitopes on spike. Yeah, so we've seen these types of papers where they look at like all the different B cells and how that works out. I think this is just like a more in-depth version of maybe something that we've seen before in terms of B-cell repertoire. And especially because they look in this particular paper, not just at the antibodies against spike, but also uh, other antibodies that are being raised against SARS-CoV-2. They have like some non-spike 
um, uh, yes, yeah, antibodies here. And uh, at the end, what they end up producing is um, a table. <laughs> I think this is like to me this is the big output of of this paper is they have mm -hmm. a table that summarizes um, the different antibody types that they found uh, like from B cells again these are like they sort out every single each B cell makes its own antibody right essentially that's the beginning of a, a monoclonal so they like look at every a bunch of these B cells that come out and whether or not they're reactive to the different um, the different mutant versions of SARS-CoV-2, and then whether or not like that, the presence of those reactive B cells also means the presence of uh, B cells that have uh, non-receptor binding domain reactive antibodies. Um, and I mean, like this is sort of the same stuff that we've seen before. Without going deeper into it, I really can't summarize it. I think that well, um, just to know that like there are gaps, right? Like some, some variants uh, are less sensitive to certain types of antibodies. We've seen that before, um, but that may also correlate with their, the presence of other antibodies that are um, in that polyclonal mix. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is kind of interesting that they kind of link uh, the variants to, where, to the places where the antibodies attack the sp for spike protein. Now, almost like kind of make, promote the idea that some of these variants have evolved to avo avoid certain antibody classes, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which is interesting. I mean, I'm kind of disappointed they didn't, like, draw a squirrel or a torso to indicate <laughs> where on the spike. Because we've seen that in papers, and we love that in papers. Researchers do more of that. That's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it's, can help with the visualization. They, they do show us these, these, like, right? They have the diagram, the structural oh, yeah. diagrams where they point out to the different uh, places where the mutations occur. Yeah, but yeah, it is this. It is a story of like, um, just what is the relationship to the variants that we see out there to the antibody complements that are inside of people. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, very interesting paper. Uh, next one is kind of on a similar note with uh, dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins and cell entry control elements in the amino terminal domains. Yeah, so this is more, so if the other one was like, what do the mutations do in relation to antibodies? This is, what do the mutations do in relation to getting into cells? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, like, the, there's, there ahead. is only, a, a, there is a limit to how much mutation you can get to a protein before it stops working. Absolutely. And uh, we've seen, I think we've, we've sort of touched on it before a little bit like we've seen like where uh studies where they do like a scanning mutagenesis over all of the spike protein and they show that um and, and they show that like across the whole spike there are places that you can't have a lot of mutations right and then we've also seen that you can't have too many mutations in the receptor binding domain because then it won't recognize ace2 anymore right yeah. so there there are definitely limits to the way mutations are done and here um, I think they're looking specifically at like the N-terminal domain of uh, like a, yeah, a particular region of that spike protein and seeing um, what mutations either let things bind a bit more or like have that binding drop off precipitously. Uh, biochemical, right? So this is like uh, <laughs> manipulating these, these proteins, these spike proteins on vir virus-like particles in the lab to try to get at what are the boundaries i guess of of operation <clears throat> yeah like this almost gets to the, the how many ver not just looking at what variants are created but how many variants are even possible it, given mm -hmm. the current structure of sars cov2 which i think is kind of an interesting way to approach that problem um yeah and i think we've seen again we've seen it before there was one where they iterated in yeast like all these different types and then like mapped like the area out but here uh, they've like zoomed in a little bit more like specifically to um, I guess a region a certain region and then testing it in a bunch of different like cell assays <laughs> uh, yeah because I think that, yeah um, yeah I think that's uh, yeah I think it's a good yeah, summary it's good, good <laughs> that's show, about good as far story. as I got into it <laughs> uh, yeah uh, next next paper is Oh, both co-infection and super-infection drive complex anaplasma marginal strain structure in a natural transmission setting. Yeah. So this is actually more of a, 
I think this is to me it was more related to like our malaria that we've been reading a bunch of malaria right. things, and um, in these vector-borne, so I think this is a vector-borne disease. Um, you can get like so like uh, every uh, thing that bites you, right? Mosquito or tick or whatever. They have like their own. Uh, they have their own strain of the of the disease probably because they bit some other animal and it did some evolution inside of their guts. Um, so if you get bit twice <laughs> by something, and that's common, right? If you're in a mosquito-dense area or a tick-dense area, you might get bit twice. It means that you'll get those two strains inside of inside of a single individual, and that's called a super infection. If the if they both sort of establish themselves, right? Because you have the same type. Um, and so you can imagine that when a, then a vector bites that super infected individual, there's like another bottleneck that's formed. And that is a different type of genetic selection that you might get in just the scenario where you only have one strain infecting you. Um, and that's what they do in this, or that's what they're studying in this particular paper. Yeah. Uh, it's, specifically uh, in cows. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of horrifying really because you get well, first you get ticks by ticks ugh, don't like them uh also the fact that you get like there's co-infection where you get two of this disease infecting at the same time and then they're competing mm -hmm. each other for space and then you got super infection where one disease is already there and then you get another one come in and start start basically competing for resources and the, the in this paper they do recognize the difference in those situations how like in one, in one, it's kind of very much an even fight. In another, it's like there's an underdog there that kind of ends up taking over and put, yes, pushing the other yes. one around. Um, yeah, if you zoom out like a lot and like really abstract this sort of scenario, like you could say that this is the same as I think we saw something about like interhost or yeah interhost very or sorry intrahost variation in SARS-CoV-2, right? Yeah. Like this idea that like viruses can can build diversity inside of an individual and have these types of evolutionary dynamics happening. Those are really right. Like it's all dependent on the organism itself. Like what is going to, uh, yeah, like it's very dependent on the organism itself. Like the, the type of, um, the type of dynamics that evolve. And so like, this is a bacterial infection, right? And like plasmodium right. is also, it's a, it's a eukaryotic parasite, parasitic infection. And so like, while like at the most abstract sense you can say oh it's all this type of like inter intra host uh evolution like the details of that are quite different depending on the life cycles of those particular viruses True. and and bacteria um the other reason i picked this because i just thought it was a really interesting way to study it um they so because this anaplasma marginale it's it's uh, endemic in certain regions of the world. I think they're looking at Ghana in this sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, so the cows that are already there presumably have been bitten several times, right? And uh, this infection, anaplasma, causes a chronic infection. So like the long-term right, outcome of having one version and then being like bombarded by all these different other versions, like that's going to... That's, that's not really the right place to be able to see, like, what are the initial dynamics of if you get, like, two strains at once inside of an organism. And so what they did was they introduced, like, naive cows. Like, they had cow calves that, like, never had seen infection before, and they just brought them to Ghana and then sampled them over a period of time, and they could see those dynamics emerge, right? Here's the time where the first, uh, the first tick got in, and, like here's the strains and then they say oh and here's the event where the second tick bit right or like what whatever a new population structure oh. got introduced into this cow so, so it's like very much like sentry animals like the way inside of an animal facility right there's sometimes they put like little animals like in the corner and if yeah. those get sick then you know there's an outbreak they did that but like with cattle in a different country <laughs> i mean firstly like horrifying secondly uh, this <laughs> does remind me of that cyborg soil thing we did last week where like they mm. again like soil is it's complex and you can't figure out the interactions so they put in yeah. something completely naive and then watched yes. as the soil like kind of microbes infected in this yeah. case they brought in cattle and then watched as each subsequent infection <laughs> happened um so, totally totally no that I, I think that's a really and i think it hopefully that helps people understand too like there are these abstract ways in which scientists can conceive of like trying to 
uh, when you're trying to study like a specific event, but there's so much noise, right? People go in in different ways to try to cut through that complexity. And of course it has its own limitations because you're bringing in this artificial thing, but hopefully like by understanding those limitations and doing other follow-up experiments, you get closer to what's going on. <laughs> <clears throat> Right. Uh, next one is the effect of BCG vaccination on pro-inflammatory responses in elderly individuals. So mm -hmm. this is um, interesting because early on in the coronavirus outbreak, people were talking a lot about about BCG because we, at that time we didn't have any viable vaccine candidates. But BCG is a weird thing because uh, uh, yeah. with BCG, they it can produce a non-specific uh, rise in immunity, which isn't necessarily yeah. the most like fun thing to hear because... Another th thing that can happen from a non-specific rise in immunity is lupus. So we don't. So, but with BC, BCG, I think it's it's a lot more complicated because I think they have used yeah. BCG to like treat other diseases. So the I think the it was I, yeah. From what I remember, like at the beginning of the pandemic, when I learned about this story, it was anecdotally noticed that people that were vaccinated by BCG had better outcomes against the flu. And so, like, people had already suspected that BCG had something. And so when SARS-CoV-2 swept the world, uh, there were some scientists who were extra attuned to looking for, like, oh, but what about for people who got BCG vaccinated? And they were like, oh, yeah, it still has this effect. Um, so the mystery is still there. Why does BCG do this? And what exactly is that nonspecific um, pro-inflammatory effect that BCG has? Uh, and this paper is trying to follow up on that. <laughs> Yeah, so this actually starts on, like, there was a, a study in 82 elderly individuals in hotspots of SARS-CoV-2 infection in around India, and they mm -hmm. took these participants and they took blood samples to see what the BCG vaccination was actually ha doing to their immune system. So, because all vaccines yep. are conversation in conversation with the immune system, and we don't really know what BCG is telling the immune system to make it do yep. its whatever it's doing, and I think this paper is trying to figure out what that conversation that's happening is. Yeah, by doing tons of chemokine, cytokine yeah. uh, inventories in vaccinated, <laughs> unvaccinated. There's like a lot of tiny graphs here. <laughs> oh, yeah, lots of... T let me see if I can pull up some of these tiny... Yeah, lots of tiny graphs. Tiny graphs. There you go. Um, yeah. But, I mean, I think, uh, you know, for people that are trying to connect all the dots, like we talk a lot about in these studies of like um do the vaccines work against x y and z variant right they like they they print out um they they show us a neutralizing antibody against these variants right that's one of the correlates of immunity that they're trying to build in right like it seems particularly relevant because you think that that uh, antibodies should be depleting the amount of active virus right and and so forth but there are all these other things going on in the immune system right other signals that are being sent that could also be correlates of immunity but People, because it's such a complicated mess of things that um, you don't often like evaluate based on these metrics, uh, whether or not something is working. But for people, I guess, that are gazing in the data who understand what all of these chemokines do and the significance of them, um, it, it's a rich source of information to sort of build a hypothesis. <clears throat> right. Uh, and that brings us to the next paper, which is called 4D Live Cell Imaging of Microgametogenesis in the human malaria parasite Plasmodium falciparum. So yeah, yeah we're so back 40 to the meaning time travel. <laughs> yeah, forty meaning time travel. <laughs> or if you're forwards, forwards in time. <laughs> or if you're in the cinema, it means that someone sprays a smell at you that doesn't smell like anything on the screen, but it seems somewhat like it. Um, <laughs> this is not like that. This is time. Um, so uh, we're back to the complex life cycle of the malaria parasite. Um, and this paper focuses on a process that's happening in the mid-gut of the mosquito. So for those of you who are rusty, the mosquito sucks your blood and takes up erythrocytes that are filled up with these uh, gametes. So gametes are like the sperm and egg for the malaria. And yeah, so and then once they kind of are sucked up in the mosquito mid-gut, those erythrocytes kind of bur burst open and the, the, the malaria has a complicated mating process in the gut of mosquitoes. And this is what this paper focuses on. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, which is kind of cool again, like being able to see very early events with microscopy, um, can tell us so much. Like I think in the last, in one of the last malaria ones there, they specifically they had found like, Oh, um, in their single cell genomic sequencing, they saw that certain, certain genes went 
like were upregulated at a specific phase. And they were like, oh, we've never connected that these genes might be upregulated at this specific phase. And um, if people remember, I, I remember just because I remember sometimes pretty images, uh, they did this like confocal image and they stained for that particular marker um, at a phase where they hadn't stained before for that particular marker. And they're like, oh, look, like we can see really interesting structures on how this parasite is. I think it was like when they burst out of the wall of the gut or something like that. Yeah. And they're like, oh, they could really see it. And so here we here again, right? Like seeing these particular life stages, right? Because we know that this organism has to move through the animal in a very specific way and also change its body form it can tell us uh, new things, right? And give us better insight on what exactly are the mechanisms or how can we study those mechanisms better uh, during the development of these organisms, the life cycle of these organisms, which are pathogens. So we want to disrupt those yeah. life cycles. <laughs> yeah, we want to stop these life cycles. And yeah. in order to do this, they've basically like created a movie of what's happening to when uh, these these gametes kind of split up into microgametes that have little, little tails on them that swim around. Um, so effectively, what this paper does is recording malaria sex tape. Uh, <laughs> this is yeah. <laughs> this is a part that is generally referred to as a malaria money shot. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, but this... totally. Like it's uh, and and you learn so much from seeing these things. Plus, it's so cool. I, I don't know. Like I get um. I, I'm, the cool factor of seeing images like this uh, always appeals to me because like this is the essence of one of the essences of microbiology. So much is understood indirectly through the ways that we view things, right? And even this, there's some element of indirect observation here where it's like they have to glow to be able to see this. We have to be able to stain to be able to see some of these things. Yes. Um, but like when you put the right set of tools together and you get these images, you're seeing something that is happening and might be important. And yeah, I don't know. It's just very cool. <laughs> Yeah, and it adds a layer of even worseness to if as if malaria could get any worse. Now you have to <laughs> think about the fact that that they they, they have have sex and they and burst, burst out of your yeah they burst out of cells and stuff. Yeah, I think that like that's one of the things about microbiology. Very squeamish when you think about like all those little interactions that are happening right <laughs> on your body or inside of your body. <clears throat> Yeah, it's all very gross, and do you know what? We're not going to get any less gross with the next paper, because the next <laughs> paper is called Early Invasion of the Bladder Wall by Solitary Bacteria Protects UPEC from Antibiotics and Neutrophil Swarms in an Organoid Model. Yeah, so yeah, almost the exact same thing with this idea of what are those first events that happen? And of course, we can't just like... Uh, take early biopsies of all these individual people, right, and their and their bladders, and understand what's happening. So these organoid models, um, I may have spoken about them before. It was something that I was doing my research in. Is that the idea is that you reconstitute those organs in sort of a in in a system, um, an artificial system. And so here they're growing fake bladders, and they put bacteria in the they reconstitute them with bacteria in the center of them, and they actually have the ability to like stretch and compress these bladders as well so there's like this sort of mechanical feedback scenario and they see that like in early events like bacteria get embedded into some of the gaps between cells and that recruits immune cells to the area um and uh that's like sort of a early colonization step if you will of of these organoids <clears throat> Yeah, and they use like some really fancy like software to take to build up these images. You can tell because like mm -hmm. they're a lot more less grainy. They're a lot more smoother than what you'd expect from most microscopes. So it's almost like yeah. they built it out using a computer image to to gather everything. But yeah, they, there's a lot of interesting movies on this paper. Um, Absolutely, but, and so this they're they're trying to position this organoid as a way of studying right um, uh, the way of studying the immune response in in the bladder right like they're sitting here they have a they have a bladder right it can get invaded by bacteria it can recruit neutrophils right like this is a great way that we can begin to understand like these early pathogenesis steps uh see them develop in a bladder you can start making mutants in your bacteria or your bladder right and try to get a sense of like what the susceptibility factors are or what the virulence factors might be uh on yeah respectively on either side of uh, this this system 
Yeah, these so, images are great. That's like yeah. another reason. It's just like fun to sometimes see um, the type of detail. And again, I think what's really important to think about is that a lot is gained by making this model, right? Like you lose complexity because it's not perfect, but you also gain all this control that like you can see the first things that happen. But when you have like a clean, when you have a native bladder, right? First of all, you can't put that person under the microscope and get these types of detailed images. Um, you can only ever get sampled time points, but some combination, right? Between sampling and modeling is like where we're gonna get um, useful information about uh, these these processes. Right, yeah. Um, and so now we're going to go to our biotech portion of the show where we look at what's <laughs> what's happening in biotech. And uh, we've got this paper called uh, Efficient Retro Element Mediated DNA Writing in Bacteria, um, mm -hmm. which is a, a paper I, I found. And then I noticed Danny had already added it to the list. So I was like, okay, well, that's, that's great. But this is... Uh, nice. <laughs> this is something that I think we've been following a little bit, uh, but... Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I think earlier it was something about generating uh, mutant libraries. It was like a new way to generate mutant libraries that seemed like very efficient, uh, didn't need chemical mutagenesis, didn't introduce like giant transposons into places. Um, and it's through this object called a retron, which I still don't fully understand because we didn't really fully yeah. read that paper. It's just like, this is still me just browsing my browsing understanding. But some sort of, um, it's some sort of reverse transcription element that exists inside of bacteria. Uh, it's able to take uh, some RNA intermediate and then turn it into DNA, which then gets recombined into the genome somewhere. Um, so that's this retron technology. And the way that this group is using it is they're saying that they want to make like a memory register inside of bacteria, a place that can um, sort of hold a history of different things that have been encountered. And so using these retrons, you can edit that library or that, that sequence of DNA uh, to understand, let's say a promoter turned something on that activated a specific editing module that edits uh, that register. And now you know that that promoter at some point was turned on. Um, and it's a way of tracking like what happened to a bacteria. <clears throat> Cause you know, like there's like millions mm. of bacteria down there in the gut or like in whatever system that you're you're studying and you want to know like what's happening like what bacteria saw what yeah right? what bacteria found its way into what niche and thus upregulated something that caused a change at the population level um and that's the hope of this technology is that they have this new editing protein this retron um can they can they use it to inscribe on the genome of a bacteria some history of, of stuff that it's seen yeah, it's it's kind of fascinating that because I think we've talked a bit about single cell like trend uh, sequencing technology, yep. and this is technique kind of like that mm -hmm. that that gets you like a snapshot of what the cell is doing at that time, whereas this can give you mm -hmm. that, a history of what the cell has been doing throughout its life cycle, which I think is a really powerful yes. technology. Actually, that could tell us yes. a lot that we don't know. So this has got me. Very excited, and the same with the Borgs got me excited last week, where we don't know what, what this can tell us, but it could be something big. Might not be, but it could be something big. <laughs> well, this is, but this is a tool, right? The Borgs were like, oh, yeah. uh, it was like a prospecting thing. Like, oh, they found them. Like, this could be like, this could be the mystery. This is more a tool to get at mysteries, yeah. right? This is like the mystery might be what does your what what does the what do your what does one bacteria in your microbiome do under a certain like condition, right? Like what happens when you eat a whole bunch of sugar yeah. or something to this one bacteria, right? Now you could put certain reporters in that bacteria, the bacteria in question. You could colonize somebody. I, I would think this is probably an animal model. You colonize the animal model with your reporter strain that has all these different. Um, all these different promoters in it and then you feed the animals like this sugar that you're curious about you collect the poop and you see all the bacteria that come out you do single cell sequencing right uh, and pick out your bacteria of interest and you look at this historical register and you say oh looks like uh these reporters were turned on yeah. at some point they're not turned on now because that was a transient event but you get this sense of like what had happened during yeah, that particular perturbation. I mean, I mean that's also <laughs> good for if you want to if you're creating a biological part like something like a, a bespoke enzyme, it's good for actually monitoring it. So testing it in because mm. mm -hmm. testing of how these parts work, we, we want to see what they're doing to the cell. So actually, that'd be 
there's all sorts of other applications for this. There's, and the one thing that I'd want to make sure of is, does this work on any bacteria other than E. coli? That's the uh, <laughs> one. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's a. Uh... That comes up a lot in synthetic biology, uh, where we people work with like a single microbe, mm. like this E. coli chassis. Uh, but if you think, uh, you know, we don't we don't know that much. We may want to study things not using E. coli, and those non E. coli systems may have whole hosts of other proteins and things that might interfere with these synthetic systems that we're reconstructing. <laughs> Yeah, but even in E. coli, there's a lot of powerful things. I mean, there's so much work you can do with phages. There's, I mean, there's that uh, mm -hmm. big, long evolution story that Richard Lensky's been doing. So the, the, there's so many, like, <laughs> cool things uh, there is a potential to do with E. coli. So, I mean, that's not to poo-poo the technology. That's, like, <laughs> me being a sport brat again. Just... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there's always yeah. more, right? I think that one of the things that you, you learn when you do research is that, like, good questions and good insight into something always breeds more questions and more work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of the challenge of, of doing doing exploratory science is like, yeah, choosing those paths that might give us more interesting questions or maybe even relate, the other big part is relating the questions that we ask to problems that already exist. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. That's a, a great paper. Uh, uh, next mm -hmm. one is... Uh, the, f the final one, which is a, a really big paper, but it's called uh, Revealing Enzyme Functional Architecture via High Throughput Microfluidic Enzyme Kinetics. Uh, so they basically pr print out a lab on a chip and they they get up mm -hmm. to like a thousand like different uh, kind of wells in it eff effectively that are opened and shut through these like microfluidics like systems where they can conduct lots of experiments at the same time. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild. It's like uh, lots of test tubes in one place, and but it's uh, they're they're even making the proteins yeah. right in this particular scenario. Yeah, they've got like so it's like yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they've got like a schematic where they like show like oh wait one part of this has okay okay I can't have have my mouse over it to indicate what parts there are. So I'm just gonna like indicate that in like. <laughs> It's in C, yeah. C right? In C, you yeah. can see, like, one part where they have the DNA, one part where they have the enzymes, and in the supplementary material, they've got, like, an entire, like, schematic of, like, where the where they put the, the molecules in, and it all runs through this microfluidic system, and it does all the experiments, that are, and it's the output's captured on the camera, where, like, there's a flash every time, like, uh, something happens, so it's yeah. big science. So this is actually really, this is very similar to, um, like, uh, it's almost like the protein version of next generation sequencing, yeah. <laughs> right? Like in next gen sequencing, like it, a large part of that technology, the Illumina machines or whatever, was enabled by the fact that they took pictures, right? They took pictures of these flow chips that had tons of oligos adhered to it. And every time like a certain fluorescent oligo was added, you'd take a picture and you'd have these images over and over again of these oligos being built up and the sequencing reaction happening uh, in parallel for, for, for hundreds and thousands. I actually don't know the scale, but like tons of oligos all at once. And here we have like a similar scenario where instead of oligos, now we have proteins, yeah. right? But they have all these different DNA sequences that they turn into proteins on the spot. And then on the spot, they, they flow things over and they start imaging like enzyme kinetics and seeing like, oh, now all these proteins, they can degrade the substrate in a certain way. And they can relate that all the way back to the DNA that they started with, uh, with all these different enzyme variants or whatever. Yeah, this is <laughs> wild. They, they do like multiple mutations and they, and because, I mean, because a lot of like molecular biology can be, it's like throwing stuff against a wall and seeing what sticks. And the more stuff you can throw at the wall mm -hmm. at the same time, the quicker you can find what works. And this is the kind of the yeah. big thing, like of, like yeah, this is. Yeah. And again, they the. But we've seen it. We've seen it too in directed evolution, right? Where you like have a big population, and you're sifting yeah. through it. Like this is just a very artificial. This is like the artificial version of it. And microfluidics, I feel, has given us a lot of these types of experimental designs, where it's like, uh, let's just uh, let's just do it all in parallel. Uh, figure out how to do it all in parallel. Yeah, com completely. And in this case, they take an enzyme and they do like mutations over like quite a large portion of it. Uh, even the so usually mm -hmm. you focus the mutation on the, just on the active site because you only have so much time in the world. But now the this microfluidics, yep. <laughs> they can do basically all of it. And then 
and use that to help predict like what's happening to its structure. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, because you learn a lot of different things. I mean, even just talking about all these SARS-CoV-2 mutations, right? It's like, oh, the mutation over here may change, right? Like the overall stability of that protein that lets it do different things. And you would never really have guessed it because it's just some other region, right? That's like hanging off the protein. Um, so yeah, there's lots of mysteries that this sort of unbiased approach to mutagenesis can can crack yeah. open. And I'm just thinking also in terms of like bioprospecting. If you're looking in, if you're looking for an enzyme that does something, like then you can use this to actually yeah. test it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just yeah, like you don't have to do this with mutagenized proteins, yeah. right? You can go and like do a library of <laughs> just random things that you found in the environment, and then try to find the function using this chip. And people did it before, right? Like, you know, this is, I, I always think this was the bread and butter of, or the, the power of microbiology back in the day is you replicate plate. <laughs> you can replicate plate your, your library of expression vectors, right, on different medias and look at like for little zones of clearing and pick them off. But here, like now you just like bypass the organisms <laughs> and do it in vitro. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, a, f- a fantastic kind of technology. It's, I think there's, there's a lot to dig in here. I mean, I looked at the supplementary material, it's 125 pa- pages. So, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we have the appetite to I cover that. I think we'd need to take some t- some time off to co- cover it. So, uh, <laughs> but speaking of which, what what tickles your fancy this so, week? So, <laughs> uh, what tickles my fancy? So, um, I feel like the retro element uh, one t- tickles my fancy. The new way of doing these because hmm. it's something that we were quite curious about. We've covered it uh, f- before, but yep. I feel like now's the time to maybe look in and see what's going on uh mm-hmm. next yeah absolutely. next one is the malaria money shot paper the 4d live imaging of <laughs> malaria and of course uh the early invasion uh, so the two papers with good images i mean i'll be honest i'm very much a sucker for those kinds of papers so you can... yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we've had, it's been fun to cover them and just see what goes on at those early stages. Um, I'm up for any of the, I actually don't really want to do the malaria money yep, shot that, one. That's fair enough. <laughs> we've, we've said all we need to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> just like, uh, yeah, it seems like some interesting pictures, but yeah, I'm just not, doesn't hold my... Um, my that. attention the restaurant one I'm, I'm really curious I'm, I'm curious because we have talked about them previously but I actually still don't know how they work necessarily yeah. um, what they're made up of I know there it's a two protein system that there's like there's the weird reverse transcriptase thing but then some sort of like single stranded binding protein that does the recombination um, I mean this is like a not really the history of it but rather <laughs> an application uh, so that's a little bit different um but yeah i mean there's also old stuff i don't know how you're feeling about old things there's an old one that we did uh linking plasmid i i thought you were somewhat interested linking in this plas- one. oh right uh, well one way to link plasmid to the bacterial yeah. genome and that then they exactly. that's yeah that is one i'm you're right that is one i'm interested in um yeah, I remember, yeah, we were somewhat interested in that. And, like, that's it's also a similar technology. We haven't talked it, – so not maybe kind of like the retrons, but, like, retrons seem like they're probably more wide-reaching. This is more like a clever use of probably existing technology to, to learn something about uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance movements. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I'm leaning towards the retro element, but I, that has made me feel like, okay, I feel like that is the kind of story you want to hone in on. Um, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah I'm not sure anything else in the past kind of interests you that, that, I, mean, I just want to throw that one out there I'm being very was... selfish what interests you um, I think no I mean from this from this crop the retron one for sure is up there in the list and uh, and the bladder model yeah. I think is kind of interesting it seems like a lot perhaps but like yeah the bladder model is uh I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, I admit I do quite like the images in the bladder model. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I, I'd be fine with either but, of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave uh, it to you. Okay, right. I feel like because um, we did a lot of videos last week, uh, so okay. <laughs> so I do 
time to dive into DNA. Yeah, dive into the retro element and stuff because it could. Mm-hmm. It's come up twice already. I want to be able to understand it the third time round. So. <laughs> yeah, because it probably will come back again. It sounds like a very efficient. It, it looks like it's like poised to replace some transposon yeah. stuff, right? Like transposons are like the go-to object where like you want to insert things randomly into the genome. But now it's like, I don't know. I guess it's like maybe inspired by the fact that CRISPR like makes these edits possible through recombination. Then this Retron one seems like it's even simpler to get at that the the strand of DNA that like uh, looks similar to something else. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the name of this paper is. Efficient retro element mediated DNA writing in bacteria. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll be. Join us uh, for a deep dive week where we will cover it uh, in more detail and try to figure out what it can and cannot tell us. Yeah, we want to remind everyone that <laughs> while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it is possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, uh, please let us know in the comments. I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter with the hashtag MicroTWJC. Uh, we both believe that peer review is a process and that we can all participate. So we hope that you've had a good time listening to us ramble on about microbiology today. And if you think you have something to add or found something unclear, just let us it's know. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Same here, Fuzz. Tune in yeah. next week for more microbiology content. <laughs>